Kirk by Odi Kirk, Odi Kirk, Odi Kirk, Odi Kirk, Odi Kirk, Odi Kirk, Kirk, Dog suck, none, none. Welcome to Windows to the Wild. I'm Will Online. I'm here in Scotland with a head cold and a group of people from New England who are here with me to view the incredible scenery, perhaps glimpse a little of the wildlife and immerse ourselves in the fantastic Scottish history. Our journey begins in Boston. We hop aboard a plane and head to Washington, D.C. From there, we catch an overnight flight to Edinburgh. The group I'm traveling with are mostly from New England. We gather after our long flight, reset our watches, and meet Jim Leslie. He's our guide for the week. Now you have steeped yourself in Scottish lore and history. You know more about it than anybody, right? I do my best. There are many expert guides here in Scotland, and uh, I, I try very hard. Now, you, how long have you been doing this? Uh, this is my third year. Is that all? That's Just great. Just a, a youngster. Yeah, but you had 30 years in the, in the Perth Constabulary, right? I did. I was a police officer for 30 good years. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I can, do, I can see you. I can see being stopped by you on the highway. You don't get away in a hurry. I've always got a story to tell you. <laughs> now, we might not all get over together, but we're After a quick head count, we're on our way down the road a short distance to Glasgow. This is where the fun begins. Glasgow is the most populous city in Scotland. The story goes that the Christian missionary St. Mungo founded what is now Glasgow in the 6th century. A church was built on the Mold and Diner Burn on the very spot where the Glasgow Cathedral now stands. take time to look around at the city's history and impressive architecture. Well, I'm in the garden this morning of a lovely house called House for an Art Lover. It's the home of the former famous Glasgow architect Charles McIntosh, who was Art Nouveau. Uh, masterpiece is right behind me here. Uh, we're going to go into the house a little later, but this is just a very lovely spot on the edge of Glasgow. Charles Rennie McIntosh was the fourth of 11 children. He was born here in Glasgow in the summer of 1868. As a kid, Charles drew and sketched and spent a lot of time in the family's backyard garden. This grew into a fascination with botanical form and growth. Later, these passions merged and formed the foundation for a successful career as an architect, designer, and painter. The buildings he created were often built from local materials and organically emerged into their surroundings. From Glasgow, we head north for about 30 minutes to Stirling Castle. It sits atop an igneous intrusion called Castle Hill and is one of the oldest and largest in Scotland. It's been home to many of the Scottish royal families. Mary Queen of Scots was crowned here. 
She also played golf. She was a very keen golfer. Golf invented in Scotland. Golf was banned by three consecutive kings because they wanted the people of Scotland to be practising their archery in case the English came over the border. Instead of which, they were trying to knock holes, balls into little holes. So the king banned golf. But of course, Mary, Queen of Scots, she quite enjoyed the golf. Uh, and so did King James V. So gradually the ban got lifted. Its mighty walls withstood at least eight sieges, including several during the wars of Scottish independence. Today it attracts a much friendlier crowd, more than half a million tourists each year. When they built that, they had to take, you see those two towers? At one stage, there were four of them, which were at least twice the height. They reduced the height and they took down the other two towers, one to build the palace, one to build the French spur. Why did they reduce the height? Well, it gets back to the cannonballs. Big towers do not go well with large cannonballs. The next day begins with a bus ride north through Trossachs National Park. The park is a mountainous protected wilderness centered on Loch Lomond. It's the fourth largest park in the British Isles at about 720 square miles. One of the new things that's happening is Ecotourism. Is there anything like that happening here? We are, there's certainly a growing area of our business. We are looking to Im minimize the impact. We have so many visitors coming here, places like Edinburgh, which are where everyone, yeah. everybody wants to come to see. Come get very busy. But we've got some fantastic countryside. We've yeah. got areas that you'll never have heard of. Just give us the chance to have free reign and we can show you some of the most wonderful landscape, rivers, mountains and away from the crowds. Uh-huh. And you could, we do this with the minimum impact, I guess. Eh? Minimum impact. We can have people staying in, you know, you went to camp or a yurt. We don't need to be staying in hotels with central heating and air conditioning. There's a lot more. Well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> for the youngsters, Willie. Oh, for oh, the youngsters. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> Our destination is Loch Katrine, which has long been an inspiration to artists and writers. We board the steamboat Sir Walter Scott and cruise the lake, perhaps to find inspiration of our own. The ship was built in 1899 and is one of the most recognized ships in Scotland. It's been upgraded over the years, but amazingly, it's still powered by its original steam engine. The natural beauty of this region was captured in poetry by the namesake of the steamship we're on, Sir Walter Scott himself. Here's a bit of his famous poem, The Lady of the Lake. Then forth the noble Douglas sprung, and on his neck his daughter hung. The monarch drank that happy hour, the sweetest, holiest draught of power, when it can say with godlike voice, Arise, sad virtue, and rejoice. Yet would not change the general eye on nature's raptures long should pry. He stepped between. Nay, Douglas, nay, steal not my proselyte away. The riddle tis my right to read that brought this happy chance to speed. Yes, Ellen. A late afternoon, we're back on the bus and off to Oban, where a surprise awaits us. God smiled on Scotland. <laughs> we have got everything. We've got history. We've got buildings that are older than oh, your yeah, own yeah. country. We saw a building today 800 years old. Okay. We've got mountains and rivers. We've got whiskey. We've got more whiskey.
Beneath the cliff that overlooks Oban is the cradle of Scotch whiskey. I know this has nothing to do with the great outdoors, but I thought you'd probably enjoy its history. The Oban Distillery began as a family-run brewery in 1793. They bottled cowbell ale. A year later, they branched into distilling whiskey. That continues today. Oban is one of the smallest whiskey makers in Scotland, with just two small stills and seven employees. But you can take my word for it, those stills work just fine. The next morning we meet at the Oban Pier. We're heading across the Sound by ferry to Cragnur on the Isle of Mull. A local naturalist is waiting for us on the island. Just to orient you, we're at uh, Jewett Castle uh, in, on the Isle of Mull. This is the ancestral home of the McLean clan. And I'm with Ruth Fleming, who, she's a naturalist, but she describes herself instead as a... An love, enthusiast. Enthusiast, <laughs> yes. <laughs> enthusiast of animals. You've been, you were great today. You're talking about white... White-tailed eagles. eagles yep. and golden eagles. And uh, Eurasian otters. These are your favorite people. The Eurasian otter is just my passion in life. I love otters. <laughs> I would spend every single day of my life, if I could, um, going out watching otters. But it's not just the otters. We have the most amazing you know, wildlife you know, on this oh. island. We have golden eagles. We have white-tailed eagles. We, you know, we have the otters. We have minke whales in our waters. We have basking Do sharks. You know, we have common seals. We have... Um, Atlantic grey seals, we have harbour porpoise, um, common dolphins, it's, it's wonderful. People come to Mole for so many reasons, but it has to be because it is, it is the premier wildlife watching destination oh, yeah. in the UK. Yeah. Do you have silkies? I don't know what silkies are. The mysterious seals that are half human and half seal. I haven't seen one yet, but you know, the Mole magic. I'm sure they're there somewhere. The, the, in this place, I could believe it, you know. <laughs> I could too. It is, it's so magical, isn't it? Molly's magic. Yeah. Well, we've had, a, we've had a great time with you today. I've had a great time too. It's been absolutely fantastic meeting everybody. I've so enjoyed my trip as well along the Ross of Malta, Iona. It's not just about the wildlife, it's the scenery as well. It is so beautiful. It's yeah. atmospheric, even in some of the weather we've had today. I mean, you know, it could be that another half an hour we wouldn't have been able to get off Iona, but that was just all well, part of the experience, well, wasn't missed, it? I thought, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> another ferry ride, and we're on our way to the Isle of Iona. The Iona Abbey and Nunnery is one of the holiest sites in Western Europe to pilgrims from around the world. It was founded in 563. You heard that right, 563 by St. Columba. Its remoteness has been and still is an ideal setting for spiritual contemplation. Before we leave the island and a trip back to Oban, we stop at Duarte Castle. Built in the 13th century, it's the ancestral home of the Clan MacLean. Throughout the centuries, it survived attacks and a siege. But by the mid-17th century, Duarte Castle was abandoned. Time and the elements took their toll. The castle fell into disrepair. A restoration beginning in 2014, however, has saved the castle, at least for now. 
we return to Oban for the night. In the morning, we'll set out for Inverness. If this looks familiar to fans of the popular TV series Outlander, well, it should. This is the Culloden battlefield, the brutal end of the Jacobite Rising in 1746. Behind me other is the red flag marking the English front line, and way beyond them, the blue flag in the far distance is where the, where the uh, Scots of the Highlanders stood just before the battle. It was the last battle because uh, the Jacobites were pretty much wiped out by it. And they had to retreat. Money Prince Charlie left never to return to power. Uh, so it's sort of a sad place. There are grave mounds behind us where soldiers were buried in mass graves and monuments, which may or may not reflect who's underneath them, but it's a, it's a sad commemoration of the battles of the religious wars. Now for something a bit more fun. Lie down. <gasps> Lie down. We're at the Lealt Sheepdog Farm, and this is Neil Ross, a master Highland Shepherd. The voice come on, bull come by. <whistles> bull! Wait to me. <whistles> Different sound. Bull! Bull! <whistles> it's to the left. Bull! Wait to me. <whistles> to the right. Bull! He gets to know the whistle sounds off by heart means right as long as he hears that sound it's hard to believe the intensity of the relationship between neil and his dogs the dog has learned left and right we make we means go right we make all we make all we make all we make we make we make all we make all we make border collies are so intelligent and eager to do their jobs and neil has trained each of the puppies with the guidance of older dogs that just a gesture or a whistle so faint that we can hardly hear it, brings them running with a herd of sheep from the ends of the fields. Like the muck, look back. Bring the sheep up close. Bring them up close. If they can't look forward in front, bring the sheep up really close and surround the dogs around the sheep. They make sure the sheep are where Neil wants them. Then they squat down and wait for the next command. Recognize. Slow up. Go left. Recognize. Come by, Merc. Recognize. Stand there. Walk slowly. Walk quicker. Straight. Slow down. Walk quicker. Wait. And light down. Merk, merk. Light down. Merk, merk. Merk, merk. Light down. One little sidebar. While we were all watching the demonstration, one of Neil's dogs sneaked off and climbed onto our bus. It didn't take long for him to sniff out and devour somebody's lunch. <laughs> Our trek around Scotland ends where it began, back in the capital, Edinburgh. I'm at Holyrood Palace, 
in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, in what uh, here they call the square, the square uh, in front of the palace. This is where the where Queen Elizabeth stops on her way to Balmoral in the summer for the salmon fishing, and uh, people here are very very proud of that. We're going to take a little tour of the palace. We've got a uh, guide here and earphones to guide us through the thing. It's all very pleasant today because it's not raining. <laughs> the palace of Holy Rood House is rich in royal history. It's the official residence of Queen Elizabeth II when she's in Scotland. It's also been the primary residence of Scottish monarchs dating back to the 16th century. The next morning we're in for a treat, a private tour of the crown jewel of castles. Edinburgh Castle was a military fortress, a royal residence, and even an armaments factory. During its 1,100-year-old history, the castle survived 26 sieges. My fascination with geology can't rest. The crag on which the castle was built is the plug of an extinct volcano. The summit is 430 feet above sea level with rocky cliffs to the south. The only accessible route to the castle is to the east. This provided a defensive advantage. The problem was the rock beneath the fortress is impermeable. Finding water and getting it to the castle was really difficult. In 1707, England and Scotland joined together under the terms of the Acts of Union. Edinburgh Castle was garrisoned by the British Army. Eight years later, a group of Jacobite Highlanders attempted to take the castle back by scaling its walls. They had help from insiders who lowered rope ladders. Unfortunately for the deserters inside the castle, their lack of mathematical skills did them in. The ladders were too short, and the attempt ended in their executions. While in Edinburgh, we came across something that surprised me. An Abraham Lincoln monument. Lincoln is the only president to have a memorial in Scotland. Why Lincoln? As we discovered, six sons of Edinburgh signed up to fight for the Union and Father Abraham. We couldn't leave Edinburgh without a tip of the hat to literary history. Yes, there are Robert Louis Stevenson, Robert Burns and Walter Scott. I have spoken quite a lot about Robert Burns the world's greatest poet. And I think in the interests of balance, I should also tell you that Scotland also has the world's worst poet, William Topaz McGonagall, renowned for his terrible verse. William McGonagall lived in Dundee and he believed he was another Robert Burns. He would write poems and he would walk from Dundee moral and knock on the door asking to see Queen Victoria so that she could read his poems and he always got turned away and he'd walk back 40 miles to Dundee, write some more poems and up he'd go I don't think she ever read any of them and just as well because they are truly awful but look closely at these stones and you'll see the names of more contemporary figures J.K. Rowling's wrote the first Harry Potter book, Just Steps From Here. She came here looking for names for her fictional wizards. Now, oh, is that cool or what?
Hope you come once again to that part of the show that I I like the least. That's a time when we have to say goodbye, but we have to. Pretty soon we're going back to the States, and I must say goodbye. I'm Willem Lang, and I hope to see you again on Windows to the Wild. And I hope Jim will be with me. <laughs> Willie, here's to you back. Come back soon. Support for the production of Windows to the Wild is provided by the Alice J. Rehn Charitable Trust, the Fuller Foundation, the Gilbert Verney Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.